All right, our recording is underway, and today's topic, I want to talk about how to evaluate research sources, because everyone has a two-part assignment in which you will write a paper and show your sources that you would select for good credibility, and then you'll also be making a PowerPoint similar to this based on that same paper. I don't want to call it a research paper, it's just an essay with some outside sources. But we're going to talk today about how to look at sources, how to evaluate them so that you pick good ones and you don't use questionable ones. I think we'll make this really practical and maybe even a little fun. So overall, we say that literacy has two different types. In general, we say literacy is just the ability to read and write. But in Florida education rules, it actually says we have to teach information literacy. So if you've had your computer concepts course, you have run into this already. But a big part of information literacy is the ability to find and evaluate sources, to look for good ones, tell when you have found one and know how to use it correctly. There's actually another word that goes with this. So if there's literacy for being able to use literature, there is numeracy, which means the ability to use numbers, that people have a basic skill in being able to do arithmetic and calculations and understand figures, like knowing how much 20% off of something that you buy at the store. So these are two basic skills that people ought to have, but the information literacy is what we're going to talk about today, because like I said, we're going to be using it right now, and by Florida regulations, it's actually something that we're supposed to teach anyway. The one thing that we are trying to find is called bias, and again, there are two types of it. Sometimes there is a conscious bias where the researcher, and I've done this myself, say I only want to use publicly regulated universities in my research and not private colleges, or I only want to use uh, faculty sources who are medical doctors, not doctors of any other kind, so that I know that I have a leaning towards the kind of sources that I prefer. That's one thing. But sometimes researchers have an unconscious bias. Uh, I don't know if anybody else experiences this, but when I hear somebody speaking with a British accent, I automatically think they're smarter, that they have higher credibility. Which is stupid because if I hear somebody and I know a professor very well who is from Japan and his English has a heavy accent, but that's a brilliant man, and his ideas would be terrific to use in one of my research papers. But sometimes we get that unconscious ear where we think, oh, this sounds fancier and this doesn't. Like if somebody from the south goes up north, they assume that, uh, you know, we're all country people that, what, Miami and Atlanta aren't big cities? Come on. But that unconscious thing is something that we want to look for in ourselves, but also in the sources that we use. And to help us remember this, that's why I have the picture of the football referee. I had a friend I used to teach with in the past who officiated college football games, but they would never allow him to referee any Gator football games. Why? Because he himself graduated from the University of Florida. So, Maybe if he was calling a game that the Gators were playing in, he might not call as many penalties on them, or he might mark the ball a little bit further for them, not on purpose, but just because he had a more favorable idea about the University of Florida, and that was just part of who he was. There's even been research done about the number of penalties that teams who wear black uniforms get versus teams who are wearing white uniforms, just because we think of a black uniform as like a black hat on a cowboy villain. So if they're wearing a black uniform, well, the Raiders and the Steelers, those must be bad guys, so they get more penalties. And the statistics prove that that kind of happens. So this unconscious stuff 
is much harder to figure out in the sources that we look at and also in ourselves when we are evaluating them. So when I start talking about different kinds of websites and sources you might want to look at, I'll give you the positive and the negative kinds of bias that you might want to look for so that you can trust the things that you find more confidently. When we talk about sources, we can also separate them into primary versus secondary, and that's why I have the numbers one and two on them to reinforce that. So when we say something is primary, we mean it's firsthand. These are the original data or it's an eyewitness account from somebody who was actually at the thing when it happened, or it's a piece of physical evidence. This is a piece of the car that was in the accident. But a secondary source could be a report about those other things, where there was a write-up done about this incident that has the data and eyewitness quotes and pictures of the evidence in it. So it's not the actual things, but it collects the actual things. So which one of them would be better? It depends. I have to give you a weaselly answer about that because this is where you have to make a judgment about what kind of paper you're trying to do, what kind of point you're trying to make, and that will lead you towards which kind of stuff you want to use. So let me give you a little example. Let's say you need crime information for a paper that you're writing. Which would be better to use? Something from a county sheriff's department here in Florida or from the FBI? And again, my answer is it depends. If you're writing a paper that has to do with local recent stuff, then you might want to use only from the local sheriff's department. But if you need to talk about national trends, the FBI collects all of those county and city reports and it does all the analysis on it. So while it would be a secondary source relative to Volusia County, it would be an excellent report because they do terrific statistics and they keep them the same way over years so you can track history and trends. So it's really about the scale and the closeness of what you need to discuss in your paper as to whether or not you want a local source or you want a national source, or if you want a primary data source from right here where it happened, or you want a secondary source. Because if you get a story out of a good newspaper or magazine, you're not getting the actual police report, but if you're getting it from a credible media outlet that has credible editors who make sure the facts are right, that's as good a thing to use. So this evaluation process, think about how close you need to be to your subject and what level you need to be, and then that will help you pick whether or not you want to use one thing instead of the other. You probably make your first move by going to Google, which is fine. You can put in here Russian army and you'll get articles about the Russian army. But if you put in here Russian army 2022, you'll probably get more recent stories about what the Russian army is doing right now as opposed to what they did in World War II or World War I. So the more specifics that you put in the Google search box, the more likely it is that you'll get articles and sites that will help you. However, you may not know that there is a layer beyond Google. Google runs a site called Google Scholar. So you may not want to use this right now, but I want you to be aware of it. Google Scholar will get you articles from the top universities. It will get you articles from the most scientific journals and magazines where they've been reviewed by other people. And as you see here, if you look at the fine print, it can even get you court cases. So you could do legal research as well as scientific or medical. I even have a couple of articles that are indexed on Google Scholar that I had written for journals back when I was at FSU. So 
if you want to go deeper than just a newspaper or a magazine story, Google Scholar will take you right to where the science happened, where the actual research was taking place and got published for the first time. So maybe as a senior or in college, you might want to dip into Google Scholar rather than just plain Google so you can get deeper and more detailed information. Because sometimes I would rather read it for myself rather than read an article by somebody else who read the research. Because maybe I don't trust that they interpreted it the way I did or they weren't looking for what I was looking for. So maybe I want to get my hands on the actual information, the actual research report. So Google Scholar would take you there much more closely than regular Google would. But when you get your websites on your list from Google or Google Scholar, whichever one, the website itself will tell you what kind of thing it is and what you can get out of it. And also, I think it will show you how it might be biased in one way or another. So let me give you some of these major ideas and show you how to use them. You look at the end of a website address and you can see what category it belongs to by what letters it ends with. So if it ends with .gov, it's a federal government site. So you see I put the word government close to the GOV just so that you can see what it's abbreviating. So the pros to that is that this is going to be the official authority that has oversight over what you're talking about. So if it's the US Department of Agriculture, that's who has the legal power and authority over who grows food and how it's transported and how it's inspected and all those things. So you're getting it right from the people in charge of it. But the downside of that will be that any government agency is going to present things on behalf of their point of view to support their authority or sometimes because politics is involved to show off what they're doing so that they get more money for their agency next year. So that at the end of the budget year, government agencies put out reports that show all the great stuff they did last year so that they get more money next year. And I've worked in the state and I've worked in the federal government and we all do that because you need to show what you did and you hope that that shows well on you. So you need to be aware that just because it's the government, it doesn't mean it's totally impartial because certainly you know, the Florida Department of Agriculture wants to sell more oranges around the world because it wants to promote Florida agriculture. U.S. Department of Agriculture wants to sell American corn overseas and make sure that that is a, a good, profitable, healthy product. So it's trying to positively promote American agriculture products. So just be aware of what might be self-serving as a way to temper the information that you're going to get from this office that has the authority. So that's .gov. If we go to .net, these are network services sites. So whoever you get your internet from, whether it's AT&T or Spectrum or whoever, they probably have a home site that's spectrum.net. So the upside to that is these are high technology companies that work directly with the stuff that you might want to know about. So they've got their hands right on it. But because these are private companies, they probably won't share information about their sales or their upload speeds or their data breaches and security problems because as a private company, they're going to hold that stuff to themselves. But if you hit a .NET site, you're looking at some kind of service provider. So just be aware of what that is if it comes up. If it's .edu, it's a higher education site. So again, I've got the word next to the abbreviation. It used to be that this was only universities, but now community colleges and state colleges also use it, and also some educational associations use it. 
but in any case, it's going to be beyond high school. So these are going to be a higher level of research available to you. So you might get things that are the latest research that comes out of the University of Florida or the University of Michigan or Harvard or whoever. However, I want you to be careful because you might accidentally be looking at just homework posted by some other student. I actually had that happen where there were students putting up their homework on a college website at another college, and my students were just using those as research sources. And those kids at the other school were just taking the same class my kids were. They didn't know any more about it than what my students did. Or you might find that the college newspaper is up on the website for the university. So again, that's just student writing. That doesn't tell you that this is high level scientific research. So you want to make sure and be careful about what you're getting, even if it looks like it's from a major university. And I'll give you a tip about how to check that a little bit later on. But be aware, education is going, an EDU website is going to be a higher education website. If it's .org, this is going to be some kind of social organization. So I use a picture here from the Humane Society. So the pro side is going to be that the Humane Society is going to know all kinds of things about animal health and welfare and animal abuse and all of those kinds of things. The downside is all of their information is going to come from the angle of animal issues. Now, I think it would be pretty hard to find somebody who was opposed to taking care of puppies. But understand that any of these organizations is going to be involved with fundraising and trying to get laws passed on behalf of their viewpoints. So when you get to a dot org, this is not an official government agency, but it is an organized group that has an issue that it's concerned about that it's trying to promote. So while they might know an awful lot of stuff about it, you have to also understand that they have a particular viewpoint. So maybe you want to find a couple of organizations, one that's for a thing and one that's against a thing to get both sides of the information. Just be aware that a dot org is not a government outfit. It is a private association of some kind. If we go to a dot com, that means it's a commercial business website. And we see dot coms all over the place. Here's the good and the bad side. The good side is you are at the site of a company that actually makes the thing. So if you go to drpepper.com, you are getting official information from that company about their products. The downside of that is they're trying to sell that product. So don't go to drpepper.com looking for articles that say, oh, by the way, Coke is also a good soft drink. They're not going to do that. Dr. Pepper will put themselves across as being the best soft drink for you to choose, which of course it is because it was invented in my hometown. But besides that, you don't expect a company to be promoting its competition. So on its own website, a company is going to promote its own stuff. If you go to the Chevy website, they are not going to be also telling you good things about Fords or Toyotas. They're going to be telling you all the good things about Chevrolet cars. So just be aware that while this is official company information, it also has the angle that the company wants to sell more of their stuff and make more profit. So that's good information. It's useful. It's close to the subject, but it comes from the people who are trying to sell it to you. Now, what about some of these other website domains like .info, .tv, and things like that? These actually exist, and anybody could buy some of these for as little as $1. So if they could get a free service to host their website or a cheap one, and they pay a dollar, 
they could put up a website and call it harvard.info and it would be totally unaffiliated with harvard it could be a fake thing and it could be run by hackers and scammers or fake people of any kind it doesn't mean these are automatically bad it just means that you want to be careful when you look at them because a lot of these oddball names that you see at the end of a website address could be from anybody for any kind of reason. Now, there's a particular rule about that last one that's called .us. The Internet Registration Agency requires that .us owners have to be U.S. citizens or permanent legal residents or the business has to be cited in the United States because U.S. is an abbreviation to be used only by the United States. Why is that an important exception for you to know? Because every country has got one of these abbreviations. So you might accidentally wind up on a site that came from a country outside the United States. Obviously, there are many, many more countries than just the United States. But they have that little abbreviation at the end to indicate what country it comes from. So you would see IR is Iran, IN is India, ID is Indonesia, and those are all very different countries from each other. So you want to be careful with that. If you look in the top right corner of the map where you see CN for China and then JP for Japan, in between them, you see there's a KP and a KR, which means North Korea or South Korea. So you could have very fine differences that could make a very big deal in your paper based on where this website is from. So just having an understanding that when you look at that website address where you found your article and you see, oh, it's got a two letter abbreviation that I'm not familiar with, I might want to see what country that is coming from. Again, this doesn't mean that it's bad. A friend of mine went to school for a semester in Ireland, and she said it was very beneficial for her to see American news presented on Irish TV because it had a different viewpoint and she got different kinds of information. So it could be good to look at things from other countries, but you should be aware of what you're looking at and where it might have come from. So that's why I wanted to give you this tip about those particular addresses. Now, a couple of extra cautions for you in doing your internet research. When you look at any website, and this is the actual humanesociety.org, there's a lot of little information down at the bottom. So I've scrolled all the way down to the bottom of the page and you see all this fine print stuff. But look at this stack that's called about HSUS, about the Humane Society of the United States. This is where you can find out what they're all about, who's in charge of it, even they show where they get their money. So wouldn't it be beneficial to know if the Humane Society got all of their money from a dog food, dog food company? They don't, they get it from private contributions, but pet food companies, probably also make donations to them. But it's a good idea to look at the bottom of a website to see, well, who is this company? Who is this organization? Where did they come from? How old are they? Who's in charge? Where do they get their money? Because that might tell you that you want to trust them or you don't want to trust them. But it's good to know that if you go down to the bottom of the page and look at this stuff, you can get that kind of information. Here's another thing to consider. This is a foreign affairs website that I get a lot of news from. So I scroll down to the bottom of an article to find out about the person who wrote the article. So their name might be on the top of the article. So you see Joe Smith wrote this article. Well, how do we know Joe Smith knows anything about anything? So I wanna to scroll to the bottom and find out who this is. So I look at the bottom of this article and I see Tanisha Fazal is a professor at Minnesota and she just wrote a book about war. So I think her article about war might be pretty good. I might trust it 
because she's a professor at a major university and just published a book about it. So I would trust that. And I would sneak those phrases into my essay. I wouldn't just use a quote that says, Fazal states, blah, 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 because my essay would not explain who this is or why that's an expert. But if I said, Fazal, comma, a professor and author from the University of Minnesota, comma, said blah, blah, blah. Now my sentence is a lot stronger because I'm leaning on this author's credibility to make my sentence credible. So it's good to be able to find these little bits, makes your essay better, and it makes you more confident in the stuff that you're using. So it's good to know how to look that stuff up. Couple more things before we close out. Can you use Wikipedia? I would never let any of my college students use Wikipedia as a source on its own. I didn't mind if they looked at a Wikipedia article to get the general idea about something. So if you didn't know something about a foreign country and you read the Wikipedia article and it would tell you when the country was founded and what wars it was in or different things, that's okay. But look at this little box that's on a Wikipedia article I pulled this morning. And this is about the Russian special forces. And it says, this section needs additional citations for verification. And if they don't get more backup on it, this might be challenged or even removed from the website. Now, this was actually a pretty good article, but because it doesn't have all the proof put in it like it needs, maybe you shouldn't trust it if you were using it for your essay. However, some articles on Wikipedia are well researched, and if you roll down to the bottom, they list the sources that they use. So I would click on those and find the original stuff that whoever wrote this for Wikipedia based their article from. That way, I'm not uh, reading this guy's article, but I might be going to an actual Russian Army website to get information about how many tanks or soldiers or whatever. So maybe the references in a Wikipedia article would be worth using. So we're talking make one more click, one more scroll down the page, but you could get a lot stronger stuff to use, a lot more trustworthy. So that's how I would approach this. So what about help sites? If you go online and you try and get help with your essay, and I put some of these up here that I already know about, but there are many more that I have bookmarked. These things automatically hit our plagiarism checker at Volusia Online. So anytime anybody pulls an essay from one of these sites, I already know it. I probably already have it bookmarked, and that's just a fast zero. And I'll tell you something else about this. The articles that I have looked at on these helpful sites usually are lousy articles. They're not well written. I've even found some that were not written in American English that probably had worse grammar and punctuation than what you can do yourself. So these things are not helpful. They're not anything to use, and I would just avoid them 100%. But going back to the previous slide, if you go to Wikipedia and you look at where that article got its information from, that will probably take you to some pretty reasonable and trustworthy information. But these official uh, help sites that put themselves over as a, uh, will help you with your homework. Garbage is not a strong enough word for me to use to describe them. I've even written to several of them and told them to knock it off and let them know when they've got swiped information from one of our classes. So the teachers, we know about it. The course software checks for these things. We know it's bad stuff. And I hope none of you fall into the trap of trying to use any of these things. Because now you have all these previous tips that will help you evaluate good websites, get good information, so you get good grades on your various essays. And that's the point that I want to leave you with because you can get good scores and you can write good essays, 
if you base it on good information and we've given you the means to acquire that. That's our lesson for today.